Welcome back to another Biostats video. In this video, we'll be talking about incidence, prevalence, precision, and accuracy, otherwise known as reliability and validity. So let's talk about incidence and prevalence. Now it's very easy to just uh, take one at a time and just talk about them, but it's even easier if we compare them together. So uh, the only real difference between incidence and prevalence is that incidence is looking at the number of new cases and giving us basically a ratio of the number of new cases to everyone that could develop the disease. When we talk about prevalence, it's not just new cases, it is all the cases, all the cases, all of the people with the disease compared to the population that we, we currently are studying. So for example, if we have, again, uh, let's say we were studying a specific population, uh, 20 people have diabetes and there are 100 people in this population, then the prevalence would be uh, 20 out of 100, 20% for that year. For example, um, and this is, what, this is why I'd say at, at a point in time, but uh, for that particular year, for example, like the prevalence is 20% for uh, 2018, so 20% for 2018. Incidence is slightly different. Incidence only talks about the new cases. So maybe maybe each month we're only getting 5 out of out of 100. 5 out of 100 are actually getting diabetes. So, so then the incidence will be 5%. And, and what does 5% mean? It means that 5% of the, of, of the people at risk are developing diabetes uh, monthly or yearly. It depends on, on the per unit of time uh, that, that's chosen. Uh, while prevalence just describes us all the existing cases within a particular point in time. Like, for example, I picked here 2018, but it could be any year, it could be any month, so on and so forth. It could even be a day. The point is it's at a point in time. So once again, incidence looks at new cases, prevalence looks at all the current cases. And this this lovely diagram here uh, really, really uh, highlights this. Prevalence, you can see, is, is everything within the bathtub, all the, all the current cases. And then uh, incidence is basically all these new cases that are trickling down. Sometimes, you know, these, these cases can actually be cured, but then they can recur. So they, they get added again to this pool, and then some die. And if you actually put the number of people who died uh, over, over the prevalence, which is basically the number of cases, uh, then you, you get something called a case case fatality uh, rate, CFR. And we talked about this in our, in our quantifying risk video. You can actually go watch that if you'd like to learn more about that. But we talked about many different ways of quantifying, quantifying risk, and one of them was case fatality rate, and that's how you reach mortality over the number of cases. Now let me just clean uh, the board really quickly, just so that you can much easier see what's, what's going on. Um, let, let's talk about these three points. These three points are actually all linked together, uh, and if you understand this formula, you can link this point and this point. So let's try and understand it. A quick warning about this formula. You're not really supposed to use it to calculate anything. You're just supposed to use it to understand the relationships that exist within this formula. So let's try and understand this formula and why they made it. Notice this equal sign here. So anything on this side, on the left side, should equal the right side, right? So notice, this side, forget about, about this nonsense of prevalence over one, one minus prevalence. Just think about it. Here we have prevalence. This side is, is the prevalence side. And this side is the incidence side. Now notice. Prevalence can sometimes equal incidence, but only when the average duration of the disease is low. Since this number, this incidence rate, has to compensate in order to keep prevalence and incidence similar. That's why they say here, prevalence is close, close to the incidence when this number is low, when, when short duration of the disease, for example, like a common cold. And this makes sense according to the formula. If this number is low, then this number has to compensate. This, com this number will compensate by being almost similar to prevalence, since this number is very, very low. However, if this number is actually very high, then this number needs to be low. So it's actually, incidence will not match prevalence. And that's why they say here prevalence will be much, much larger than incidence for chronic diseases because this number will be high. This number will be will be basically not allowing the incidence to be high. Therefore, prevalence will be much higher than incidence. Once again, you're not really supposed to calculate anything, but you're just supposed to understand this relationship uh, and how it exists here. Last but not least, they mentioned two little points here. Uh, one is that the prevalence is very similar to the pretest probability. Now, what is the pretest probability? Uh, to keep it simple, it is the probability of having a disease before you even get any tests. For example, let's say I have a test uh, of, for, for iron deficiency anemia. And let's say uh, the prevalence of, of iron deficiency anemia in this population, let's say, for example, it is 10%. That means anyone who walks into my clinic, let's just, for the sake of simplicity, let's say they don't have any risk factors, let's just imagine that, you know, the population's prevalence is 10%. That means every 1 in 10 people that walk into my clinic who are going to take a test, they have a 10% chance 
of actually having the disease. And this makes sense because the prevalence of the disease is 10%, so the pretest probability has to be 10%. Another thing they note here is that with an increasing prevalence, you get an increased positive predictive value, but a decreasing negative predictive value. I harp on this a lot, a lot, a lot in my sensitivity, uh, specificity, negative predictive value, positive predictive value video. I'll link it up and you can, you can go watch that if you'd like. And I urge you to go see that video if you'd like to understand this relationship more. I feel like I talked about it more enough there so that I won't really um, you know, keep repeating the concepts over and over again in these videos. Now this table is very, very important. This table is a further understanding of this formula. So for the purposes of understanding it further, let's just draw two lines here. Let's say this is 2018, and let's say this is 19, as in years 2019, 2018, 2019, and this whole timeline is X. Okay? Sometimes you get specific cases at certain times, right? These dots are when the cases first began. Okay? Now if you increase the survival time, you will not increase incidence in any way since you're not adding any more of these dots however you might push all of these a bit further and any points behind might actually intersect within this area that we're interested in right between 18 and 19 and and we might count them so so you're not really increasing the dots you're not increasing the cases but you're, you're increasing the, the length of these of these cases so they might act you know, cases before before the, the the time we're interested in might actually go on so long that they might push into the time we're interested in. For that reason, we might count them, and for that reason, we might increase prevalence. If you increase mortality, you will decrease prevalence, but incidence will stay the same. Now, this makes sense. It especially makes sense because survival time is going to be the exact opposite of mortality. Increasing survival time and, and increasing mortality. Increasing mortality is basically decreasing survival time. So it makes sense why this should be the exact opposite of this. And these obviously do not change. If there is a faster recovery time, that's similar to, you know, a less survival time. Although, although they're not exactly uh, the same meaning-wise, but on paper, they, they yield the same results, where, where, where how long he's going to be having the case is actually going to be shortened. And for that reason, it's similar to, to you know, decreasing survival time, increasing mortality, and you're going to have decreased prevalence. When we talk about extensive vaccine administration, obviously this is going to decrease the number of new cases, as well as decrease the number of existing cases. This means that both incidence and prevalence will decrease, and this should make sense to you. If you decrease the risk factors, well, this is just like decreasing the number of new cases and decreasing the, the, the prevalence. This is why uh, when they talk about, you know, cardiovascular diseases, they, they try and limit the number of risk factors that a person has by, uh, you know, fixing their blood sugar, fixing their dyslipidemia, etc., etc., because they want to decrease the incidence of MI, they want to decrease the prevalence of MI, MI meaning myocardial infarction, but this basically should cover it for incidence and prevalence. Again, incidence new, prevalence all, all the existing cases, and being able to quickly understand which situation affects incidence and prevalence and how they affect it is going to be the key in, in how you understand prevalence and incidence. All right, now we have precision, otherwise known as reliability, and accuracy, otherwise known as validity. Now, it's very important that you differentiate both. One of the ways you can differentiate both is just by their name. Precision means that your points that you get are very closely aligned. They're very close to each other. Accuracy means that whatever you're testing is actually close to what it's supposed to be testing. For example, I love using these, um, you know, archery, this archery example. Here, for example, notice how all the points are close to each other. So already you can say that it is highly precise. You can rely on it in order to, to keep getting the same or at least close to the same result often as possible. And it's also highly accurate. Notice how it is going to the inner circle of this whole archery board. Right? So it, it is not only highly precise, but also highly accurate, since it's going in the center of this board. To compare it, let's say we have a test. For example, uh, it, a normal test is supposed to get, get a score of 200. And then, uh, you know, this, this test that we're using is getting a score of 201, 202, and then 199. Notice how all the all the all the numbers are very close to each other, and and the original test that was used as standard. Notice how they are all also very close to it. Therefore, because they're close to each other, then it's highly reliable. It is highly precise, 
And because it is close to the standard test, that it was already 200, and they're, they're all close to that number, it is also highly accurate and highly valid. This example, notice how all the, all the points are actually very close to each other, but then you go and see that these points are actually very far from the center point. So for that reason, it is, it is highly reliable. You can always be sure that the number you're going to get is going to be close to, to the other numbers. But the standard test, let's say it was supposed to be 200, they might get, for example, 150, 151, 152. They're going to be quite far from the standard test, which says 200. Let's take this example. Notice how it is somewhat going to the center of this board, so it is highly valid since, since all, the, all these points are dancing around this, this middle point. However, every point is widely spaced from the other. An example of this would be, would be getting 250, 200, and 150. Notice how all of them are sort of dancing around this middle number. If you take an average of them, they're going to go to 200. They're going to go to 200 if you take an average of them. However, each point from, from itself is going to be very different, assuming that this is going to be 250 and this is 150. Each point is, is far away from each other, and for that reason, it's, it's not really that reliable, but it's highly accurate. And this last example, notice how they're all sort of dancing very, very far from the middle point, so it's not that accurate. And also, notice how they're also very spaced from each other, therefore it's not reliable. So again, precision, the consistency and reproducibility of a test. In other words, getting a specific value and you compare it with the same values of the same test. When you talk about validity, we're comparing these numbers to a standard test that got, for example, 200 or whatever, and we're seeing, is it close to that standard test or not? The closeness of test results to the true values. How do we get the true values? We use sort of standardized test procedures. Now, these are pretty straightforward, so no one really asks you much about them. Instead, they ask you here. They ask you, does random error affect precision or accuracy, or does systematic error affect accuracy or precision? The best way to explain this is by recalling this example. Re remember how I was talking about having sort of a test saying, oh, 200, and then 210, and then, for example, 205. And this is the same test, and then we're comparing it to the standard test, which is saying, for example, 200. Now notice, within this test only, this test, not comparing it to the standard test, you can notice that the only thing that differentiates these three points is random variation. That is to say, since it's the same test, the only really way you can get different, uh, different answers is by is by randomness. Randomness gives you these three these three components. However, let's take another example. Let's say the standard test is telling us 250. That's the standard test. And let's say our three points are, for example, 200, uh, 210. Let's take the same ones and 205. So notice. There is, there is some randomness going on here, but it doesn't really explain why they're so far from this point. So why is that? Why is that? Why is that the case? Well, it could be because there's a systematic error. There is, there is actually a problem when you're, when you're calculating each of these points, and you're doing the same mistake over and over and over again. And when you do the same mistake over and over and over again, it's not going to matter. Randomness is not going to matter. They will still be equally random from each other because you're doing the same exact mistake in each one. Another way to explain this is let's say you have, for example, uh, a weighing machine. and Let's say you altered it. You sort of changed it so that it actually adds, uh, it actually adds 10 kilograms to the person who's being weighed. So let's say someone who's 60 kilograms is actually being weighted. He will become 70 kilograms, 70 kilograms. Let's say someone is, for example, 70, he'll turn into 80. Let's say someone was, for example, 85, he'll turn into 95. The idea is notice that the only difference between these points is randomness. However, they're all still as equally random as these three points. The only difference is that instead of being these true values, they are these values because there is a systematic error in play. The way they were calculated was wrong because each person is, is for some reason being added 10 kilograms. Another, another practical example of this is let's say you're doing uh, blood pressure. Instead of using, for example, the normal cuff, you're using a pediatric cuff. In that case, you're actually 
you're doing a systematic error because although you're getting equally random results from person to person, you are still doing the same mistake for each and every single person. Therefore, it is a systematic error in play, causing a decrease in accuracy. So remember, random error is what affects precision. It decreases precision. Systematic error, it's what affects accuracy. It decreases accuracy. Never, ever, ever mix these two up, and you should understand them. Always remember the weighing machine and how someone changed it to add in 10 kilograms, and you should be good to go. And with that said, hopefully you benefited from this video. Consider liking and subscribing, and as always, thanks for watching.